we think about aging gracefully, I think many of us focus on appearance and wonder, what will I look like 20, 30, maybe 40 years from now? But is there more to it than that? I'd like to share a story with you about an old glass house in Pittsburgh called Phipps Conservatory that opened in 1893 and tell you a little bit about what we've learned. Now, the original purpose of Phipps was to provide a place in Pittsburgh for people to be able to see and enjoy the beauty of nature. Now, this was really important back then because the Pittsburgh of 1893 was a much different place than it is today. Back then, people had an extractive view of the world and they thought there was no limit to the amount of pollution we could produce or natural resources we could use. In fact, they thought we were gonna conquer nature. Nevertheless, people in Pittsburgh loved Phipps, and every year they would line up for hours just to see the two and later three seasonal flower shows. And over its first 100 years, Phipps had many good times, but it also had some bad times as well, such as when a major hailstorm in 1937 forced the conservatory to close for over a year, and it resulted in the loss of the upper section of glass, called an OG, from the main building. By the time 1993 had rolled around, the conservatory was in tough shape. And the city, after having steel collapse in the region, realized that they could no longer afford to run the conservatory, so they spun it off to a nonprofit organization. Now, we, one of the first things we realized when we took over was that we needed to continue this wonderful tradition of doing these spectacular flower shows for the people of Pittsburgh. We also made a commitment to make sure that we'd extend the three shows to year-round shows, so there would always be something for people to see. We started working on a three-phase master plan that at first was focused on this idea of replacing all the dilapidated facilities and improving visitor amenities. But we had to ask ourselves, is just making the conservatory look like it did in the old days the only thing we should be doing? Or could we be looking at other ways to make it more relevant for the future while still respecting the past? The first project we started to work on was, called our, was our visitor center. Now this was in the late 1990s, and we heard about this new green building certification program coming out called LEED. We also learned that buildings account for about 40% of the energy and water we use and pollution we produce. We had no idea. We said, we care about, our, we care about the environment. Why shouldn't our buildings reflect our values? So we decided to pursue LEED certification on this project. And when the visitor center opened in March of 2005, it was the first LEED certified visitor center in a public garden. But something very interesting happened along the way. I remember one day during construction, I was walked down into the cafe, and I noticed a worker taking these gray tiles out of a box and putting them in the floor. And when I looked on the box, it said made in Turkey on it. And I was really surprised because my understanding of LEED was you're supposed to use local materials to avoid all the energy it takes to transport heavy materials around the globe. So I called up one of the people on the project and I said, why are we using tile from Turkey? I thought we are supposed to use local products. Do you know what he said? He said, oh, we already got that point. I said, wait a minute. We're not doing this just to get the points. And as soon as you get your points, you go back to the old way. We're doing this because we think it's the right thing to do. Well, that one tile completely changed the direction of everything we've done since. All of a sudden, we found ourselves saying, if we think it's the right thing to do, we're going to do it. We don't care if we get any points or not. So for example, Leeds said we have to use 20% renewable energy in the visitor center. We said, why stop with 20%? Let's do 100%. Then we said, why stop with the visitor center? Let's do our entire campus. So we did that. We didn't get any points for it, but we, th we thought it was the right thing to do. We ripped the irrigation system out of our front lawn. We switched to organic lawn care. We got rid of toxic pesticides and cleaning products. We didn't get any points for that either. The original cafe, it was designed to have all the food produced off-site, wrapped in plastic, brought in and then served with plastic disposable serviceware. We said, we don't want to do that either. We want to make all our food on-site with fresh food, feature local and organic foods, and we want to get rid of all the plastic disposables, and we did that. A couple of years later, we even got rid of bottled water. And because we have a lot of children that come to Phipps, we also decided to get rid of junk food and soda as well. We started to get very excited, because now 
not only were our buildings lining, aligning with our values, but our operations were as well. Our next project opened in April of 2006 and was our production greenhouses. Now originally we were told you cannot get a greenhouse LEED certified because there's so much glass you'd never make all, meet the energy requirements. We decided to make them be as efficient as we can anyway. And when we were finished, we went back and got them LEED certified. We got platinum under the existing buildings program. That's the highest level you can get. For our next project, we decided, our next project was our Tropical Forest Conservatory. It also opened in, in 2006. And for this building, we challenged our architects and engineers and the traditional way of designing conservatories by doing such things as of, of putting in underground earth tubes and a massive roof venting system. This conservatory ended up being one of the most energy efficient conservatories in the world. And what's really remarkable about this space is that even though there's a giant south facing glass wall, it never gets hotter inside than outside and it's 100% passively cooled. It uses virtually no energy to do that. Here is a greenhouse that has no greenhouse effect. It really is remarkable. By this time, we found ourselves thinking in systems, which is how nature works. And in November of 2006, the Living Building Challenge was announced. This is the most rigorous green building standard in the world. And it's based on systems thinking. The Living Building Challenge requires that your building be relevant to place. It must be net zero water, net positive energy, must be free from toxic materials, and it must, it must support human health and happiness, equity, and beauty. We decided to pursue this certification for our next building, which was our Education Research Administration building, called the Center for Sustainable Landscapes. Now, when we started this process, we thought the hardest thing we were going to have to do is meet those really strict water and energy requirements. But it turned out that the hardest thing we had to do was meet the, the materials requirements. Because the Living Building Challenge has a red list of over 800 toxic chemicals you're not allowed to have in any of your building products. And it turns out that most building products have at least one of those chemicals in them. Now this really hit home one day when I had a professor from Carnegie Mellon University come by with a visiting professor from Germany. And he wanted to show him what we were working on. So I started to tell him about our project, and I started to tell him about the red list. And he looked at me and he just smiled and he goes, oh, you Americans, you make me laugh. What's the first thing you do when you find out you're gonna have a baby? You paint the room, you buy new furniture, you put in new carpet, and then when the baby arrives, you lock him in the room and you watch him from a safe distance with a baby monitor. Meanwhile, all those new products are off-gassing all these chemicals some of which are toxic. I was completely taken aback. Now let me ask you, how many of you have done something like that or know someone that's done something like that? We just assume because we can buy something, it must be safe. We don't ask questions. The Center for Sustainable Landscapes opened in December of 2012. And it was, and still is, one of the greenest buildings in the world. It met the Living Building Challenge. It met LEED Platinum. It met Well Platinum, and it was the first building to get Well Platinum, which is how buildings affect human health. And it was the first building to get Sites Platinum, which is how buildings interact with the landscape. And it's still the only building in the world to have met all four of these certifications in one building. To me, this building exemplifies what good looks like. It's net zero energy, which means it, it makes more energy than it uses each year. It captures and treats all its stormwater on site. And it's built to the highest levels of building efficiency and human and environmental health. It's a, and it's a wonderful place to work in. While we were going through this process, we also learned a new term called biophilia. And biophilia refers to the innate desire that all of us, want, all of us have to want to be connected to nature. It's why we like to garden. It's why we like to have pets. It's why we'll pay extra to have a hotel room if we could have a view of the mountains or the ocean. We also learned something else that we already instinctively knew, and that is being connected to nature can make us healthier, happier, and more productive. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because we spend over 90% of our lives in buildings. And for many of us, 
If you're lucky enough to have a window, you probably can't open it. We are so disconnected from nature that we think that nature is something you see when you're on vacation. When the fact of the matter is, nature is around us everywhere, even in the city. You just have to look for it. We need to look for it, we need to embrace it, and we need to bring nature into the places where we live, learn, work, and play. Everybody deserves a green, healthy space. And when we started to think about expanding our, building a new classroom because of our expanding children's programs, the first thing we did was we started to look around the country to see if we could see examples of what a good classroom looks like. <clears throat> and we were surprised to learn that in this country, most school districts, when they need additional classroom space, they buy a portable. This is a really bad idea. Portables are notorious for us off-gassing all these chemicals, some of which are toxic. So we challenged ourselves to see if we could build a portable classroom that could be designed to meet the living building challenge and be free from toxic materials. We also did this because we wanted to start a conversation in our community about the kinds of places we're putting children in. Children are the most vulnerable members of society, and yet we put them in some of the worst places. That building opened in April of 2015, and we immediately started to work on our new maintenance facility. Now, originally we thought <clears throat> we'd, take, we'd tear down this old public works building and put our new building on top of that space. But then we said, you know, there's a lot of old building stock in Pittsburgh, and the greenest building is one that already exists. So wouldn't it be great if we could take this old, ugly, cinder block building and turn it into one of the greenest buildings in the world? And then we said, who else besides children usually gets crummy places? Maintenance people. So what if we also made it one of the healthiest places in the world and would build it to meet the Living Building Challenge and Well Platinum as well as LEED? That building opened in June of 2019. Now originally, if you wanted to experience FIPS, you had to come to FIPS. And as we started to align our programs with our values, we started to look outside our glass house walls and into the community. And we started to develop a number of programs, like our homegrown program, where we'll go out and install raised bed vegetable gardens in people's backyards and food desert areas. Our sustainable land care program teaches landscapers how to take care of people's properties without using toxic chemicals. And our Studio FIPS is our consulting pro program so that we can help others who want to learn from what we've learned. What a journey it's been, from switching to 100% renewable energy, to reducing, then offsetting our carbon, to even divesting from fossil fuels. We are, we are constantly learning and challenging ourselves to align our buildings, operations, and programs with our values. And we're constantly exploring the important connections between human and environmental health. Several years ago, I heard a statistic that said that if everyone in the world were to try to live like we live in the United States, it would take five planets worth of resources to do that. Now think about that. That's obviously impossible. So we need to be smarter. We need to understand that our unsustainable use of natural resources and exponential population growth is putting tremendous pressure on the planet. And it's leading to such things as climate change, loss of habitats, and loss of biodiversity. But these, this, these are not the problem. These are the symptom of the problem. The real problem is the lifestyles we lead. We can say the same thing about, hum same thing about human health. We focus on the symptoms and not the real problem, and the problem is the lifestyles we lead. We need to change the way we live and we need to recognize that human and environmental health are connected. And what's, what's exciting to me is to, to be able to say that we have the technology and the capacity now to address these lifestyle issues. We just need the will to do it. At Phipps, we see ourselves as part of nature, and we see everything as being connected. And we're try constantly trying to reconcile what we say and what we do with how nature works. What a change and what a contrast. On the one hand, we have this old building from 1893 that represents the best, 
the best example of the worst kind of building you could possibly build. A single pane glass house designed to grow tropical plants in a temperate climate. Clearly a manifestation of this idea that man will conquer nature and an extractive view of the world. And on the very same campus, we have some of the greenest buildings in the world. Both sets of buildings connect us to nature, but only one set recognizes that we're a part of nature and demonstrates that we can live in harmony with it. We've completely taken the idea of connecting people to nature at Phipps and completely turned it on its head. We recognize, we, we respect the past, but we don't look back, we look forward. And we're constantly learning and challenging ourselves and asking questions. And what about that old glass house? Well, <clears throat> I can tell you after 126 years, it's looking pretty good now. We even restored the old OG that's been missing for the last 80 years. But what's more important is that we have never gotten old. We continue to reinvent ourselves in response to the changing times. That to me is one of the most exciting things. And that to me is what, what aging gracefully is all about. It, grace and beauty are rooted in being authentic to yourself. And that is something I think all of us can embrace in our, each of our lives. And what have I learned in addition from this old glass house? That we're a part of nature, that human health and environmental health are connected and then we must constantly evolve with the rest of the world in order to be relevant for the future. Thank you.